Hey, man, thank you for that, Brother and Mrs. Jones. I think, uh, I think all of these family specials are keepers. Well, that'll end on Sunday morning, but, um, <laughs> but I'll tell you what, I think we found some new talent, and uh, that certainly is a, is a blessing. If you have your Bibles tonight, take them, we'll go to 1 Samuel chapter number 1. 1 Samuel uh, chapter number 1. And I do want to welcome, we have a couple of special guests with us tonight. Vice President Hiles Anderson College is with us, so traveling uh, to a, a youth conference in, in Rochester, New York. I believe they'll make the rest of the trip tomorrow. And as well as a student who uh, is, um, I believe, getting ready to finish up up there. And uh, we're certainly thankful to have them in our service. And uh, you greet them when the service comes to a conclusion. That'd be great. Um, we certainly are, are preaching and uh, through, the, um, uh, through the, the month of February in the home and the family. And um, we're going to look in 1 Samuel chapter number 1 this evening. And we're going to talk tonight. The title of the message is A Mother's Prayer. A Mother's Prayer. And before we get into it, you know, sometimes I feel like a Wednesday night, everybody just kind of comes dragging in. And, um, and, I, and I'm, I'm assuming that there's a reason for that. You've all worked hard and, and uh, midway through the week and uh, we're stressed and we're tired and we're exhausted. And uh, so I thought maybe I'd share just some things that might hopefully put a smile on your face and maybe wake you up just a little bit. And so I, uh, I looked at some, uh, some things I thought were somewhat humorous as far as mothers are concerned. I thought I'd share some of them with you tonight. Uh, I, I found, I came across the Mother's Dictionary of Meanings, the Mother's Dictionary of Meanings, and my favorite one is this first one, it's, um, the word is dumbwaiter, a dumbwaiter, and uh, that is one who asks if the kids would care to order dessert. I thought that was pretty good, a dumbwaiter, <laughs> and uh, I think there's some truth to that. Here's another good one, Mo- this is a Mother's Dictionary of Meanings, grandparents, grandparents, the people who think your children are wonderful, even though they're sure you're not raising them right. <laughs> I thought that was humorous as well. Uh, hearsay, hearsay, what toddlers do when anyone mutters a dirty word. Hearsay, I thought, man, that's probably, there's probably some truth there. Independent, independent, here's a really good one. Independent, how we want our children to be for as long as they do everything we say. <laughs> so you be independent, just do everything that I tell you to do, all right? Show off. Here we go. Show off. That's a child who is more talented than yours. They're just a show off. And, and then uh, who done it? Who done it? None of the kids that live in your house. That's who done it. So. And then I, uh, then I found this. Here's some things mom would never say. Here's some things mom would never say. How on earth can you see the TV sitting so far back? <laughs> I thought that was pretty good. I used to have a grandparent that would say, don't sit so close to the TV. You're going to ruin your eyes. So uh, Here's another thing a mom would never say. Yeah, I used to skip school a lot too. <laughs> Uh, Here's another good one. Yeah, just leave all the lights on. It makes the house look more cheery. (laughs) Uh, Here we go. Let let me smell that shirt. Yeah, it's good for another week. (laughs) Oh, that was good. Oh, here's another. Now, here's one that would never have been said in my house. Here we go. The curfew is just a general time to shoot for. It's not like I'm running a prison around here. (laughs) And then uh, here's the last one. I don't have a tissue with me. Just use your sleeve. So... These are things a mother would never say. And then I thought this was a cute little story that uh, maybe will put a smile on your face. Uh, for, for weeks, a six-year-old little boy kept telling his first grade teacher about the baby brother or sister that was expected at his house. One day, the mother allowed the boy to feel the movements of the unborn child. The six-year-old was obviously impressed but made no comment. Furthermore, he stopped telling his teacher about the impending event. The teacher finally sat the boy on her lap and said, Tommy, Whatever has become of that baby brother or sister you were expecting at home? Tommy burst into tears and confessed, I think mommy ate it. So, anyways. <laughs> All right. Well, hopefully you're awake and, and uh, maybe ready to, uh, to hear what the Bible has to say tonight. We're going to talk about a mother's prayer. First Samuel chapter number 1 is where we are. We'll begin reading in verse number 19, and we'll read down through verse number 28. The Bible says, And they arose in the morning early and worshipped before the Lord and returned came to their house to Ramah, and Elkanah knew Hannah his wife, and the Lord remembered her. Wherefore it came to pass, when the time was come, about after Hannah had conceived, that she bare a son, and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. And the man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer unto the Lord the yearly sacrifice in his vow. But Hannah went not up, for she said unto her husband, I will not go up until the child be weaned, and then, will, then I will bring him that he may appear before the Lord and there abide forever. Now Elkanah, her husband, said unto her, Do what seemeth thee good. Tarry until thou have weaned him. Only the Lord establish his word. So the woman abode and gave her son suck until she weaned him. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with three bullocks and one ephah of flour and a bottle of wine and brought him unto the house of the Lord in Shiloh. 
And the child was young. And they slew a bullock and brought the child to Eli. And she said, O oh my Lord, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee here praying unto the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me my petition which I asked of him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord. And he worshipped the Lord there. It has been said that the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. I like that phrase. I think that's a good, a good statement. The work of the mother is so significant. In fact, it's so significant that even Napoleon Bonaparte said this, the future destiny of a child is the work of a mother. The future destiny of a child is the work of a mother. When considering the life of Samuel, specifically his birth and his early years, his formative years, his mother Hannah takes center stage. This is a bit unusual because typically the Bible narrative focuses on the father, but not in Samuel's case. And while I think there perhaps are a few things about Elkanah that seems to indicate that he was a good man and his habits of worship certainly are commendable, it is Samuel's mother that shines forth the greatest and best in the realm of faith and in the realm of Samuel's birth and of his life. I was thinking today, there's no greater love in all the world apart from the love of God for mankind. But beyond that, there's no greater love in all of the world than the love of a mother for her child. There's nothing a mother will not do in order to give her child the very best. A mother will sacrifice some of her wants and needs in order for her children to be satisfied. Mothers experience the pain of childbirth. They endure the sleepless nights of babies who wake up hungry or sick. They wipe the tears away, they kiss the boo-boos and become the shoulder to cry on during difficult moments. There's something special about the role of a mother and, and her child. And I'm certain that most of us have, have very fond memories of our early days as children. Uh, I certainly have been married now for 16 and a half years and, and uh, we'll oftentimes, my wife and I will talk about our younger days. Sometimes our kids will ask us, they'll say, you know, Daddy, tell me a story about when you were younger. Or, Mommy, tell me a story about when you were younger, and, and I'll, I'll tell them some story, and, and they always seem to enjoy that. Sometimes they want to hear the same story over and over again. And I don't mind telling it because they're fond memories. And I, I, I was blessed as a young person to grow up in a godly home. And I think of some of the stories my wife tells about her mother. My wife speaks of her mother's unique talent to produce a delicious meal with very few ingredients. My parents, my in-laws, I should say, were immigrants to this country, and uh, they moved here, and uh, for a time, their life was extremely difficult in just trying to make ends meet. And my wife would recount sometimes knowing that there was very little food, if any at all, in the house. And somehow, some way, her mother would uh, conjure up a meal that was, that was there to, that was delicious and met the needs of the family when there was hardly anything in the home with which to cook. Uh, I, I think of some of my memories, and I, I can remember we, as, uh, as kids, we lived uh, on, Bidoff, uh, on Bidoff Road, right across from that shopping center. In fact, if you'll drive down Bidoff, you'll see a house that has some pillars. It's a duplex, and we lived on the right-hand side. In fact, the house we used to live in, there's a big Buddha statue that sits right in front of it. Uh, it wasn't there when I got there, or when I lived there. I can promise you that. Um, you know, so anyways, but uh, I can remember we would, my mom, she would, we were at that time, uh, you know, our parents, you know, didn't have a whole lot either, new in the ministry and, and we lived close to the church. And so a lot of times, if I remember correctly, we only have, we had only had one car. And uh, my mom, of course, raising three young boys knew that we had to get out of the house every once in a while. And I can remember her getting us all ready and we'd walk out the door and she'd walk us to the park and we'd spend hours at the playground and, and just playing. And I, I can remember some of those memories and, and some of those things. And, and, and lest, you, lest, you, um, uh, lest you think that uh, think otherwise, my mother too was a great cook as visual testimony of this fact stands before you tonight. As we, um, as we come to 1 Samuel though, we find ourselves during a difficult moment in Israel's history. The period of the judges would last for four centuries, 400 years, and Samuel would be the one who would bridge the gap between the judges and the kings. He was similar to John the Baptist in that he had a transitional ministry. According to John Butler in his book on, on the, the prophet Samuel, he said, John the Baptist closed out the law and Moses and ushered in grace in Jesus Christ according to Luke 16, 16. So Samuel concluded the time of the judges in Israel and ushered in the times of the kings. But all of this began, listen, all of this began with a mother's prayer. 
Hannah had no desire to raise a, a legend. She had no desire to give, to give birth to someone who would be known thousands of years after he lived. She simply had a desire for a child of her own. She didn't need him to accomplish anything of great worth. She just longed for someone to love, someone that she could call her own. And this prayer she prays here in 1 Samuel chapter number 1, moved the heart of God and opened her womb. And the world, listen, the world was blessed as a result. I want us to consider Hannah tonight and the powerful prayer she prayed in which God gave her this son. Number one, I want you to consider, first of all, Hannah's sorrow in verses 1 through 8. Hannah's sorrow in verses 1 through 8. We learn, first of all, that she had sorrow because she was involved in a plural marriage. The Bible tells us in verse number 1, Now there was a certain man of Ramatham Zophim of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroam, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zeph, and Ephrathite. Notice the first phrase of verse number 2, And he had two wives. She was in a plural marriage. And while it is true that we see many Bible characters in plural marriages, it is also true that God never condones it, he never blesses it, and that the end result is always very problematic for all those involved. And such was the case with Elkanah and his two wives. And I certainly think you are very well aware, along with me, that God's plan is clearly given throughout Scripture Specifically given to us in Genesis 2, verse number 24, where the Bible says there, this. Therefore shall a man, one man, leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife. It does not say cleave unto his wives, but it says cleave unto his wife and they, those two, shall be one flesh. Not those three or four or five or six. And so God's plan has always been one man and one woman for life. And you mark it down. Every time you see something different in the scriptures, you, you, you do not find joy, you do not find happiness, you do not find bliss. Now certainly God works in spite of man's mistakes. And, you know, we think of some of the products of, uh, of, 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 of a plural marriage as far as the children that were born and Certainly we understand that Joseph was a, a product of a plural marriage. We, now we find that Solomon, he was raised in a home in which he had one father but multiple mothers. And we certainly consider Samuel living in that type of an environment as well. And, and, and God, God allowed these, these men to rise above some of these circumstances, but it is never blessed by God. And so this was a problem for Hannah. This was a great grief to her. This was not something that she would have chosen for herself. We'll talk in just a moment as to why this plural marriage most likely existed, but this was certainly part of the sorrow in which Hannah felt on a day-to-day basis. But not only did she have sorrow because she was in a plural marriage, but she also sorrowed because she was barren. Many in the days in which Hannah lived viewed barrenness as God's punishment upon you for some sin in your life. And as ridiculous as that may sound, that's how many people looked at things. Furthermore, a Jewish woman desperately wanted a, a male child in hopes that he would be the Messiah or that perhaps the Messiah would come through him. And it, at, the very, at the very least, she longed for a male child so that, uh, that, so that her husband uh, would have a name that would carry on long after he was gone and that she would be the one to have provided that for him. I think about abortion and unwanted children. Now, these were not problems during the day in which Hannah lived. There was, there was no thought whatsoever of that. When a woman found out that she was expecting, it was, a, it was a special time. It was a precious time. It was something that she had longed for. There was no such thing as unwanted children. There certainly was no such thing as abortion during that day and age. You see, the women who lived during the time of Hannah, they longed for children because they understood that children were in heritage of the Lord, according to Psalm 127 and verse number 3. I stop here for just a moment. I ask the question, doesn't... Hannah's barrenness seems so unfair. She was a godly woman. She would provide a child, a, a wonderful mother, and, and, and yet she was barren. She would nurture that child, and she would love that child, and she would raise that child to serve the Lord and to honor the Lord all of his or her days, and yet, for some reason or another, she was barren. Does it ever bother you? That some who seem to be so unfit to be mothers have no problem conceiving children? 
And others who would provide a child with nurturing care and love remain barren? I, 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 I don't have the answers for that. I don't know why God allows for these sorts of things, but we must trust him in all things. And, and yet we learn from this story that we can always pray when we perceive a great dissatisfaction in life. And here was Hannah, and the one thing she wanted most was to be able to bear a child. We see not only was she in a plural marriage, and that provided sorrow, and she was barren, and that provided sorrow, but there was two other things we must consider. First of all, second, thirdly, we see that she had an adversary. Did you notice in verse number two, and he had two wives, the name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. Notice verse Verse number six, and her adversary also provoked her sore, speaking of Penina, for to make her fret because the Lord had shut up her womb. And as he did so year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her, therefore she wept and did not eat. Not only was it difficult for Hannah to be in a plural marriage, but it was made worse by the fact that she was barren while her husband's other wife had many children. There are many that believe that the reason why she was involved in a plural marriage in the first place is because she could not bear children. And as a result, Elkanah thought it was, it was necessary for him to take another wife, that he might have a child by this other wife. Kind of a similarity between Abraham and Sarah and when they brought Hagar into the relationship and, and, uh, and, and their son was born, Ishmael was born as a result of, of that relationship. Hannah was the first wife. She was the wife of Elkanah's youth, and yet another wife was taken because of Hannah's inability to conceive a child. And Penina was the type of person who, listen, she was the type of person who could not experience blessing without becoming proud and difficult to deal with. In other words, in her case, the blessing was children, and she could not be satisfied with the fact that she had these children, but she had to use these children as almost a pawn or something to hold over the head of her, uh, of her perceived adversary or enemy. See, I have children and you don't. What's wrong with you? And, and certainly Elkanah loves me more than he loves you because I've given him sons, I've given him daughters, and this was of great sorrow to Hannah's heart. How, how, how you handle this and how you handle your your blessing says a great deal about you. And none of what is said about Penina here is positive. The Bible refers to her as an adversary. We see not only was she sorrowful because of this adversary, but lastly, she was sorrowful because she had a husband who did not understand her. In verse number eight, the Bible says, Then said Elkanah, her husband, to her, Hannah, why weepest thou? And why eatest thou not? And why is thy heart grieved? Am not I better to thee than ten sons? <laughs> Boy, we, we, we men sometimes aren't so bright, are we? Elkanah's not very bright in this, in this story. And for the longing of her heart is a child. And he makes things worse when he says, am, not, am I not better to you than ten sons? And Hannah doesn't give an answer. She's way, way too classy for that. But I, I think the re answer is a resounding no. You're, you're not better than me to the ten sons because this is the longing of my heart. It's the one thing that I long to do for you that I'm not able to do. You say, well, what's the point of all of this? What's the point of Hannah's sorrow? Why does God include this? I, I think perhaps maybe God includes this because Hannah certainly was a godly woman. But listen, godliness never eliminates our problems and our issues. Because we live in a sin-cursed world, we're still going to have problems and issues to deal with, no matter how godly we might be. And here was Hannah. She is pure, and she is wholesome, and she's godly, and she's loving, and she's kind, and yet she is, uh, she is besieged all around for problems, great problems that brought great sorrow and trouble into her life. So we see Hannah's sorrow, but notice, secondly, we see Hannah's prayer. In verses 9 to 18. A simple Google search reveals many mother's prayers that are found online. Here's one I particularly enjoyed. Oh, give me patience when we hands tug at me with their small demands. And give me gentle and smiling eyes. Keep my lips from hasty replies. And let not weariness, confusion, or noise obscure my vision of life's fleeting joys. So when in years to come my house is still, no bitter memories its room may fill. Oh, that was a 
a sweet little prayer that a mother could certainly offer and ask for the Lord to give her these things. But we consider Hannah's prayer, and Hannah's prayer was much more intense and much deeper and, and, and in some respects even greater than the prayer that was just mentioned a moment ago. We consider that, first of all, it was an emotional prayer. Would you look in verse number 10? The Bible says, actually look at verse number 9. So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by a post of the temple of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. Hannah's prayer was an emotional prayer. The Bible tells us that this prayer was marked by specific characteristics. It tells us that she was in bitterness of soul. Of the definitions given to bitterness in our dictionary, I think the one that best describes Hannah's spirit is this. Keen sorrow, painful affliction, vexation, deep distress of mind. In other words, this idea of bitterness of soul, is, it's more of speaking of the idea of a broken heart. Broken hearted over not being able to conceive a child and not being able to be a mother. Further, the Bible tells us that she wept sore. Her, her prayer featured strong crying and tears. It was a fervent, affectionate, and emotional prayer. And the Bible doesn't tell us how long she prayed, but we assume that it was a lengthy time spent agonizing over the difficulties of her life as a barren woman. I have to ask the question, when was the last time, when was the last time you got alone with God about a specific matter? When was the last time that you, that with a broken heart, got out on your face before God and you cried out to God and you shared your burdens with the Lord? When was the last time? So often our lives, we live such blessed lives and oftentimes, and I don't, I don't pray that you go through trials, but, uh, but so often we, 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 have, we feel like we have little to nothing to pray about. And may God break our hearts that even if things are going well, we, we live in a world where we're surrounded by people in which life's not going so well. People that have great challenges, and may God break our hearts for them, and may God burden us for them to be able to reach them. Hers was an emotional prayer, but notice it was a deal-making prayer. Look in verse number 11. She vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid, and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but wilt give unto thine handmaid a man-child. And I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. Have you ever been here before? Have you ever wanted something so bad? Maybe it was something good. Maybe it was something that you desperately needed. But as you prayed and you begged God for whatever it is that you were burdened about, you you're willing to make a deal with God. Lord, if you'll do this for me, here's what I'll do for you in return. Sometimes people bargain or make or try to make deals with, with God. Again, Lord, if you'll get me out of this situation, I'll do this. Or if you'll give me this, this desire of my heart, I'll do this for you in return. I don't know how effective these prayers are, but I will, I will echo the truths that are found in Scripture in Ecclesiastes 5 and verse number 4 where the Bible says, When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it. For he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. So many are quick to make promises to God while in need. And as soon as they find themselves out of the predicament that they were in, they, they no longer have an intention of following through on the commitments that they have made. And, and, and if you've made a deal with God and if you've promised God something in return for something else, and if for some reason he decides to answer that prayer, you better, you better give God what you vowed. You better fulfill the vow that you have made and the God in heaven will hold you accountable for that. But notice, thirdly, I see that not only was it a, an emotional prayer and a deal-making prayer, but I think it was also a satisfying prayer. For look in verse number 18. And she said, let thine handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. You know, there are times in life in which the only thing that can settle our souls and give us peace is time spent alone with God. And until we, until we get to that point in life, until we get down on our knees and we cast all of our burdens upon the Lord, as the Bible tells us in 1 Peter 5, 7, to casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Until we do that, we cannot have peace and we cannot have joy and we cannot have contentment. 
And in the midst of Hannah's desire for a child, something that she wanted more than anything in life and something that she was truly brokenhearted about, when she finally got alone with God and she laid this burden at his throne and at his feet, she got up from that season of prayer and the Bible says that she went away and she was able to eat and her countenance was no more sad. I think sometimes that perhaps if we spent a little bit more time in prayer with the Lord, maybe we wouldn't be dragging the way we sometimes do. Maybe he'd give a smile back to our faces and he'd give a a bounce and a spring back into our step and he'd give us his joy once again. And and perhaps maybe one of the reasons why we're dragging and one of the reasons why we're struggling is because we've not spent sufficient enough time with God. And may God help us. May God help us to get alone with him for time spent with God in this way is so satisfying. I, um, I can tell you that there are times in which I learn of a, of a situation or a burden and because of the, maybe the busyness of life, I, in the back of my mind, I almost have this attitude, I can't wait. I can't wait to get alone with God about this. I can't wait until my prayer time comes because I've, I've just got some things that I just need to unload and I, I look forward to that. I, I long for that day. I long for that part of my day. I I look forward to it because I know that if I bring my problems to the Heavenly Father and I leave them in His hands, listen, it's all going to be okay. He's going to take care of it. And that's exactly the attitude and the spirit that Hannah had. Her prayer was a satisfying prayer. Can I tell you that prayer is our most valuable resource in this life? We should pray about everything, the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. Our greatest prayers are when we're most passionate about a particular matter. But again, I remind you, if you make a vow to God in prayer, you'd better fulfill that which you have vowed. We've considered Hannah's sorrow. We've considered her prayer tonight. Lastly, let's consider Hannah's gift. In verses 19 through 28, we read this passage of Scripture, and so we won't take time to read it again. But we find that God gave her a son in verse number 20. The effectiveness of a mother's prayer and her intense desire moved the very, listen, Move the very heart of the Lord. Listen to what the Bible says in verse number 19 at the end of the verse. And the Lord remembered her. It wasn't a matter of, well, he had forgotten about her. It was the idea that, hey, I'm going to remember this prayer and I'm going to answer this prayer on your behalf. The Lord remembered her. God gave her a son. The greatest gift in life comes from above, according to James 1.17. And God gave Hannah what she could have never given to herself. And I think to myself, in some, in some ways, we too have experienced a similar gift. For God has given us a gift that we could never supply for ourselves, and that gift is salvation. No matter how hard Hannah tried and no matter uh, what natural remedies that she might have tried to to deal with the barrenness of her womb, in and of herself she was completely and totally incapable of dealing with this problem. It was something that only God can do. And I think to myself, you and I, when we're born into this world, we're born with a sin nature. And no matter what we do, no matter how many good works we do, no matter how much money we give uh, to a church or how how many churches we join or how many times we get baptized, not, uh, not any of those things can wash away our sin. The only thing that can deal with our sin problem is, is this gift that God gives us in his son, Jesus Christ. I think there's a lesson in all of that. God gave her something that she could not have supplied for herself. God does the same for us. God gave her a son, but notice, notice not only we consider Hannah's gift, he gave her a son, but Hannah gave her son back to the Lord. You ever thought about how hard that would be? I'm sure, I'm sure all the mothers in this room, if you're not familiar with the story, you've thought about how hard that would be. Oh, I, I, I suppose maybe there are some days in which it might be easier than others. <laughs> To think about, yeah, I'll, I'll turn him over to the church for a, uh, for a few years of his life. <laughs> no thanks, we're not interested, all right? You just hold on to your own kids. But, uh, uh, but, but, I, but I think to myself uh, how difficult that must, must have been. The, the Bible seems to indicate that this was a journey from where they lived to Shiloh, where the, where the, where the, the minister of God was. We don't exactly know how long the journey was. At least I have not taken time to research it, but I would assume they would have walked. And and as a result of that, it might have been a several hour journey. It may have even been several days of a journey. And she's taking her little boy. Most believe that a child was weaned between the ages of three and five. And I can just think as she walks that long road to Shiloh, 
realizing that I'm going to leave this little boy and I, 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 I'll probably see him again, but, but there's no guarantees. And I'm giving him back to the Lord because I made this vow, I made this promise. And, and I just have to think, she thought to herself, man, I, am, I truly am making a sacrifice. And she was. We would all agree with that. Can I tell you that a, I believe a model is found here for every parent in that we ought to give our children to God for his work and service. Again, I, I'm, not, I'm not advocating leaving them at the church and walking away and, and just allowing the church to try to figure out how to best meet their needs. But I'm, I'm talking about getting our children into church and teaching them the scriptures and, and praying for them. And, and, and when God begins to work in their heart and in their life, not, not quenching the moving of the Holy Ghost, but encouraging that. I work with teenagers long enough to know that there were times a teenager would go to camp or go to a youth conference and I mean, they'd get alone with God and they'd sense God was working in their heart and their life and they'd go home and, and it wasn't long before the parents would put that fire out. Oh, no, 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 you, you're not going to be a missionary or preacher. You're going to be a doctor. You're going to take care of me in my old age. You're going uh, you're, you're to go out and be successful in life. And, and uh, you know, no, no preacher in this house. And I, they, they never ever came out and said that, but their attitude was such. But that wasn't Hannah's attitude. No, I've made this promise. I've made this vow to God. And, and too many parents try to deter their children from serving the Lord when we ought to be encouraging our children to serve the Lord. There's nothing, there's nothing greater that your kids can do than to give their life to the Lord. And, and sometimes that just means that they're going to be a successful businessman, but they're going to serve the Lord in that way. But we ought to encourage our children to serve the Lord and to give their life to the Lord. But let me say that here's a, here's a final takeaway when I think about Hannah's gift is this. As, as, as we say often, as we've heard said often throughout our lives, you can never outgive God. Amen. Listen, God gave Hannah a son, and Hannah, in fulfilling of her vow, gave that son back to the Lord. But listen, that's not the end of the story. God wasn't finished. You see, Hannah begged and prayed, God, the one thing that I want in life is the son. And God says, okay, I want to give you the one thing that you want in life. But remember the vow that you made to me when you prayed. And Hannah said, okay, Lord, I'll give him back to you. God said, oh, I'm, I'm not, I can't be outdone. I'm the God of heaven. I'm the God of the universe. And you can't ever outgive me. And so I want you to take your Bible and go to chapter number two. And look in verse number 18. It says, but Samuel ministered before the Lord, being a child girded with a linen ephod. Moreover, his mother made him a little coat and brought it to him from year to year when she came up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. And Eli blessed Elkanah and his wife and said, the Lord give thee seed of this woman for the loan which is lent to the Lord. And they went into their own home. Notice, and the Lord visited Hannah so that she conceived and bare three sons and two daughters. Amen. And the child Samuel grew before the Lord. Amen. God said, Hannah, thank you for giving this boy to me. I'm going to make something out of his life, but you're not going to go unrewarded. I'm going to give you more than you could have ever dreamed. I'm going to give you not just one son, but I'm going to give you three sons. I'm not going to just give you three sons, but I'm also going to give you two daughters. And your house is going to be overflowing with children. And no doubt Hannah lived to be so thankful for the day that she gave her son to the Lord. Look, it started in sorrow. Many times the greatest stories in all of the Bible start with a broken heart. They, and they continue with a man or with a woman getting down on their face before God and saying, here is my problem, here is my situation, here's what I'm dealing with. And God answers in a way that only he can. God does more for them than they could have ever dreamed that he would possibly do. And listen, the same God who worked in Hannah's life and the same God who gave Samuel to Hannah is the same God who is still at work in your life and in my life tonight. And I don't know what you're burdened about, I don't, know what, I don't know what's happening in your life, but here's what I do know. I need know this. The world needs more mothers like Hannah. The world needs more Samuels, young men who are given back to the Lord. This church needs more mothers like Hannah, mothers who will take their problems to the Lord in prayer rather than maybe taking them to someone else. We're talking about here's the issue that I have. No, let's just get alone with God. Let's just pour our heart out to the Lord. And let that be the highlight of our of our day and of our lives. Mothers who will pay that which they have vowed to the Lord. Listen, Hannah is a marvelous example of a godly mother. Perhaps maybe you have a mother in your life 
in which you can maybe even go home tonight and still pick up the phone and call them and say, Mom, I love you. Thank you for what you've done for me. Thank you for the godliness that you instilled in me. Thank you for loving me. Perhaps maybe there's some here tonight you can no longer do that. Your mother's passed from one life to the next, but certainly you can continue to make an impact on those that are here and continue that legacy that was given to you. Perhaps maybe there are some tonight that long for, for the role, long to be called a mother, and maybe God has dealt with you tonight, and maybe you just need to spend a little bit of time privately. Maybe not necessarily even here at the altar, but going home and getting alone with God and begging and pleading and asking God to do the same work in you that he did in the life of Hannah. Thank God for a mother's prayer. Would you bow your